Hello and welcome back to Information Technology Fundamentals. We're going to be looking at shared storage and how it's used in computer systems. We're going to look at the different ways we can share files uh, and storage on a local network. We're going to describe the means of sharing files and services across the internet and look at the importance of backups and how to configure them. One of the main purposes of networking is to share files and data with other computers. We can do that locally through several different uh, methods. Uh, on our computer, we can share any drive or folder uh, that's on the computer, and we can put that on the network, whether it's uh, a local disk or a CD drive or just a folder. In order for this to work on a local area network, of course, the uh, local computer has to be turned on, it has to be attached to the network, and the settings to share the, the uh, resource has to be turned on. Networks can also have something called network attached storage. We see an image of it here, and it's really a box that contains multiple hard drives. We'll call it an appliance, and its whole purpose is to do file sharing. Uh, you can put multiple disks in there and we can use all kinds of different protocols. But most importantly, it's connected to the network through an IP address and a particular computer doesn't have to be turned on. Your NAS attached storage simply needs to be turned on all the time and everyone will have access to it. So it gives you a large amount of storage for your local network. Printers are all uh, often shared on networks as well. It's not very cost effective, uh, especially in a larger office, for every uh, user to have their own printer. It's much more cost effective to have one printer that is utilized by many people. Uh, so we are constantly sharing printers on the networks. Uh, Windows has some built-in features to share. Uh, printers. Uh, in this screen right here you can see that they have pulled up a laser printer. They clicked on the sharing tab of the properties box and they simply had the check mark share this printer, gave it a name, and now everybody on the network is going to be able to find that printer and use it. Uh, even larger networks will have a dedicated server uh, to handle the print jobs. Uh, now that's going to be a, a network that has maybe hundreds or thousands of users using printers all the time. Uh, on a Soho network, you're typically going to have the, uh, the network printing and sharing win in Windows is going to be sufficient to get the work done. A computer is going to be either in a work group or a domain, and that's going to affect how things are shared on the network. Uh, recall that a work group means that each uh, individual computer on the network. The user is responsible for that computer. The user gets to determine what is shared and what is not shared. Uh, on a domain, that means that the user logs into a domain server and the domain server provides all the permissions and what is going to be shared and what is not. And of course, the domain server is uh, taken care of by the IT department and the individual individual user does not have any control over that. Now, when we want to share something with uh, other people on the network or even other people on the computer, we're going to right click and choose share. And then we're going to come across this dialog box that you see pictured here. And in here, you're going to see the names of people that we're going to give permission to use the resource with. Now, in this case, there's a couple of different names, but if I wanted to give everyone the ability to use whatever this resource is, I would just simply select everyone and decide between read, read, write. In a work group, each computer has to have that set up individually by the owner or the user. And on the uh, domain server, that's going to be determined by the IT department. Windows has a file and printer sharing uh, section in the networking uh, set up. And in here you can configure how your computer is going to behave on different types of networks, on uh, guest or public networks, on private networks. And in here is where you would turn on 
in this example, it says public folder sharing. Uh, recall that in Windows, there's a set of public folders on every Windows computer, and you can turn on that ability to share those among multiple users. And we'll also see on a guest in public networks, the ability to turn sharing on and off as well. And the same thing with private sharing. And then we also have the ability to use encryption with passwords to secure the data between devices. If we want to find the all the possible uh, network shares and drives on our computer, we'll just simply open up our file explorer and click on network and it will bring up all the devices and resources that have been shared on the network. This is going to vary quite a bit depending on the network. You'll also see that they have names that follow the universal naming convention as far as paths on the network. Hosted sharing and storage. And now we're talking about sharing information outside of our local area network. So uh, one of the things we can do with HTTP is we can provide hyper hyperlinks to documents uh, on other websites. This means that we can use a web server to uh, access a particular file. I can put a file on a web server. I can provide a link. Someone could click on that link and then download the file right directly in HTTP. File transfer protocol, which has been around for quite a while, uh, is a protocol designed strictly to download and upload files. There are dedicated FTP clients that you can install. Most of them are free. And they're a little more efficient at uploading and downloading if you're doing a lot of that type of work with an FTP server. And there are, uh, FTP protocol by itself is not encrypted, but there are secure versions of it that can be used to upload and download encrypted files. We cannot skip by cloud computing if we're talking about storing things remotely on the web. It is perhaps the most commonly used uh, hosted storage. But really that brings us to the question of what is cloud computing? Generally it refers to any sort of computing resource provided to the customer on a pay-per-use basis. The customer is not responsible for the management of the hardware that's used to store it underneath. So we pay per use, so we pay for exactly how much storage we want. It has rapid elasticity, which means if I need a gigabyte today and I want 10 gigabytes tomorrow, I can do that quite easily. Usually it's self-service, self-service. And the cloud depends on uh, virtualization in particular to make this happen. However, on the end user side, we don't know uh, exactly where our data is stored physically, and we don't know exactly how it's stored as well. We just know it's available to us anywhere. So what are some of the cloud-based storage uh, solutions? Well, we've got Apple, uh, iCloud, Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, Box, Draw, uh, Dropbox, Box, Amazon, and I could go on and on. There's a whole big list of different uh, cloud-based storage. Some of these work strictly through a browser. Some have an app that you put on your computer, and some also have companion apps for uh, your devices. And OneDrive, for instance, integrates entirely with File Explorer, so it becomes a shortcut when you open File Explorer, giving you easy access to it. Uh, when we talk about the cloud, uh, here's an example of Google Docs. Now, when I work with Google Docs, everything I do in my Google Docs is saved in my Google Drive, so it's in the cloud. Microsoft has the same thing with 365, but one of the nice features here is since it's in the cloud, I can share it with other people, and we can all work on the same document simultaneously. There is something called peer-to-peer -peer file sharing which is different from the uh, like Google Drive and OneDrive and all those. Those rely on a central server to access the data. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, there isn't a central server 
you have a whole bunch of clients and they all contribute to the sharing and the uh, data that's stored can be on any one or even likely multiple peers at the same time. So it fragments the files into different pieces and stores them on different computers. The classic example of that is the BitTorrent network. So if we're talking about sharing data, we have to include uh, backups because essentially what we're doing is we are backing up our data and it's going to be on multiple systems and in fact it's actually shared that way. And so we've got a few different things we want to consider is uh, backing up our data, backing up our system configuration, including our operating system. Where are we going to keep up our backup copies? Are they going to be on-site, off-site, both? Uh, how are we going to secure them? So here are a few backup storage types. We could have locally attached storage, so just simply another hard drive on your computer. We could have take advantage of a, a NAS, a network attached storage. Many companies now are using cloud-based uh, solutions for this. So everything that I store on my computer is automatically stored in the cloud. So I can, if something happens to my computer, I can retrieve it that way. But it's really recommended that we use multiple methods to do a comprehensive backup. Frequently they're referred to as a three to one. Three copies of the data, two on-site and one off-site. So we have to decide what we're going to back up. Maybe there's data on our computers that there's really no reason to back it up and store it. On the other hand, we probably have critical or sensitive data we have to make sure is backed up uh, maybe uh, more than even once a day. So we have to know where is it stored, and when we set up our backup, we have to ask ourselves the question, did we get all of our critical and sensitive files? A database is uh, needs a little bit different touch for backups. So a database is always updating itself. And one of the ways we have to in, uh, preserve the integrity of it is we have to back up every transaction that occurs. And a large da uh, database is going to have millions of transactions. So sometimes we'll make... Uh, an exact copy, kind of like a mirror. So each time a transaction takes place in our main database, it is replicated in our backup database. We would also then uh, bring in a point in time backup. So maybe twice a day or once a day, we back up the entire database uh, and we can use that to go back in time if we had to. Now, operating systems may or may not need to be backed up. Uh, obviously, you can go and get a Windows image at any point, and if you have a license, in theory, you could reinstall it. However, when you do that, you don't preserve any of your settings. So if you make an, an uh, OS backup, you want to do it after you have everything set up. Uh, otherwise, it really offers you no great advantage. But having a backup of your operating system is going to be a little bit faster to recover from uh, file corruption or something uh, uh, like a malware infection. Windows has a couple of different backup techniques. They have their old backup and restore from Windows 7, which allows you to select what you want to backup, schedule it, uh, or you can just tell it to do it whenever you want. Uh, beginning in Windows 8 and Windows 10, uh, Windows brought over uh, something called the file history. So now if you turn that on, uh, each time a file is modified, a version is kept of it. So if I was working on a document in Word and I was saving it um, several times a day, I could go back in time and look at a version from two days ago if there was something in there I wanted. So uh, it's a lot more flexible and allows uh, users to regain information they might have otherwise lost. So the question also is how often should I back up my data? Well, this is gonna vary uh, tremendously how much data is recorded every day. It, do we need to do it on a daily, on an hourly? So all the, the questions about scheduling and frequency have to be addressed by looking at how a user is using their data. And we there's a few things to keep in, in your mind. Uh, how are you going to recover it? How much space do you have for storage? How long do I want to keep the backups? Um, and can I afford and have offsite uh, 
backup. If I want to restore my data from a backup, um, I have to know a couple of things. One is when the backup occurred, were there any errors? You should really be addressing this after each backup. Um, most of the backup utilities will give you a message if it didn't, if something didn't backup successfully. The most common reason it doesn't work is because you ran out of storage on your backup uh, storage device. Uh, and of course, configuration, we already talked about that. You should practice uh, occasionally on restoring a single file or multiple files or the whole thing just to make sure your backup system is working correctly. So in this lesson we looked at ways to share files and storage. We looked at the different means of sharing uh, files most locally on and on the internet and we explored the importance of backups and how to configure some basic backup options.